So, do you expect to make culpa from those who hold the world in their hands? Or have the world in their grasp? Or by its throat? Uh, I don't think so. I think they no longer care. And they're going all the way, regardless. They have crossed that bridge. I don't know whether it is a moral bridge, what it is. I think it is a moral bridge. It's already, and they burnt it. And now they are all the way, whatever it takes, to consolidate power. I've been watching, I say this because I've been watching all these things that are going on, the uh, the International Court of Justice, the Assange case, the of course the Ukrainian-Russia uh, conflict, the Israel-Palestinian conflict, and I see a common thread there. I think at the very top is really the same people making the decisions. I think that is pretty evident, really. And then within their own sphere, you know, they will we have discussed this so many times. They have their minions, you know, their minions with the the bankers, <laughs> the, the 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 bankers counting their money, the the politicians wearing their purple, the uh, and the other minions and sub minions and so on. <laughs> and they're all practically following the same direction and following the same orders. I think they are now on a binge, as it were, you know, with, uh, with addicts talking about something else. They, uh, at, the, at the very beginning, when you first start with your addiction, perhaps it's possible to reason. And uh, when you are halfway through, it becomes more and more difficult. And then at the end, you just don't care and you just go for it. Mm. Um, it's as if you're saying you, to yourself, I, 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 I cannot come back, I cannot go back, and even if I could, I don't want to anymore. And these people are sort of um, up there on the, on the cloud, sort of seeing, as it were, what is going on beneath them, and they're not affected by it. What do they have in common, these, these four things? Let me take one by one. With the International Court of Justice, I see all those countries putting forward their arguments and, um, you know, Article 44, Article 55 of the United Nations, the charter that, is, that they are all making their point. Um, and then what? the court will go and deliberate and uh, come back in um, a few weeks time to decide what. In the meantime practically everybody's dead. I was, uh, I was quite surprised at the fact that the Arab states did not actually come together and reacted when the whole thing first started. Some were trying to convince us that um, they were being very wise about it, that they didn't want to retaliate uh, emotionally and so on, but they were all talking and thinking about it and taking it carefully and deliberately and so on. And I bought into that. I thought, well, that's 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 a good thing, you know, because uh, we we need sort of sound minds that can actually think about consequences. Garland Nixon has a funny. Uh, Garland Nixon is. Uh, I I watch him because he's so amusing. He's a black American, and talk about the gift of the gap. This guy has it, and he was once talking about trying, uh, not trying, he describing Putin, and he was saying, look, 
Pudding is not a person who reacts immediately. Um, he said, for example, you and I, okay, I say, you are a jerk, and you say to me, you are a jerk, and I say, no, you are, no, you are, and then I punch you on the nose, and you punch me on the nose, and then we have a fight. <laughs> and he said, that's not pudding. Pudding, <laughs> you, you call him a jerk, you punch him on the nose, and then he says, hmm, I'll see you in a mo." Well, I was hoping that uh, perhaps the Arab states will reach this mo <laughs> and uh, do something, whatever they thought, you know. Yes, uh, not not emotionally, but the, uh, you know, thinking about the li deliberate and then and then act. But they haven't acted. So when is that moment going to come? They are there at the International Court of Justice. They're doing very well. They're expressing their concerns. And, but they haven't done anything. So by the time they do something, if they do, it might just be too late. You know. I hope this is not a farce. I think, you know, we're all trying to go through international law and so on, but international law, you know what they say, justice is slow and at the end it might not change things at all. And by being so overly prudent, it allows perhaps, you know, um, the other side to go perhaps just too far. So I don't have great hopes there. I was watching the Assange case too. I must admit I hadn't paid a lot of attention. I was aware of the case, but I hadn't followed it. <coughs> and um, the reaction is Oh dear, my voice breaking again. The reaction from commentators seem to be that they are a little bit hopeful. Why? Because the judges, the two judges, some of them are, uh, the two judges seem to be, you know, interested and really listening and asking questions and that hadn't happened before so there is a little slight ray of hope that they might look at it and uh, carefully and, and see the injustice of it all and so I don't think so <laughs> if you remember First of all, Assange has never been tried in court. He has never been convicted of anything. The whole thing is about whether he is to be extradited to America or not. Okay. But even though he has never been convicted, this poor guy has spent like I don't know how many years in the Ecuadorian uh, embassy and then in prison here uh, four, four, four or five years in solitary confinement, a person who has never been tried or found guilty of anything, and you, you just wonder how, how is this possible in Great Britain? And if I remember, I think one of the judges said that he should not be extradited way back and then immediately another one I don't remember the names I'm sorry perhaps I should have checked it this out but and then another judge a woman judge um, reversed the opinion and that is why he has been there for the uh, all these years and of course, uh, needless to say, that particular judge uh, was later on promoted, as you would expect. So, 
So now these two judges are there listening attentively to, you know, everything and asking questions. As if one of them, one of the commentators said, I was quite surprised that they were asking this and that and that the other question because surely they have it. I mean, that is so well known even by everybody that it looks as if they had never heard of the case. They certainly haven't read their papers beforehand because those questions were, you know, just just so obvious. It's, um, you see, I, I, I am not uh, accepting this uh, argument. I think, obviously, there are only two possible ways. Either he will be extradited or he won't. And if he is not, I do not think that it is because justice has finally come. I think it's probably because the powers that be are rather tired of the case anyway. The lesson has been learned about journalism and what you can and cannot as a journalist do. And that lesson has been learned. So it might be that since they are so occupied in all many other things, that this is no longer the most important lesson. This is no longer the most important thing that they have in their hands. So I would say that it, it is actually quite possible that they said, okay, let it, let, let it drop. That's a possibility. Because we know that the two judges, certainly one of them, is very much aware, has to be, because he has uh, heard arguments. He was, he was uh, the defense for the uh, intelligence services in other cases. So they are not unaware of intelligence. So it is difficult to see that they would have never kind of even, you know, be familiar with the case. I, do, I, don't, I don't buy that. So if they uh, say, if the verdict, I don't know that that is the right word, if, if they come to the conclusion that he should, should not be, it is because it is no longer important to the powers that be. On the other hand, he could be and these people on the other side who said uh, who say that it is perhaps within very much within the realms of possibility that he might that we will know that the uh, verdict will come in a few weeks or perhaps uh, a few days and then we will know and uh, i i if they decide that he is going to be extradited we will probably find out at the same time that the plane arrives in the United States. I don't think they're going to give people enough time to go on demonstrations. Not not that they care so much about demonstrations. You know, it's uh, go on, go and demonstrate. Yes, free speech, we believe in that. Uh, but they will probably, it will probably be something that it will be done carefully and cautiously and... Uh, avoiding it as, as much uh, popular strife as they as they can with regards to the russian and um, ukraine uh, ukrainian conflict i hear that um, president zelensky is actually quite demoralized at this point they say it's. Uh, it looks as if he's beginning to finally begins to to, uh, you know, sink in that he's not going to get all the material that he needs and so on. Um, well, <laughs> um, what took him so long <laughs> to realize this? And it is 
probably probable that they will just say it doesn't matter what you think my dear you know you keep on and uh, you know this could uh, then turn into a, a guerrilla war you know just acts of uh, hitting this place and that place and, um terrorist acts of terrorism i think they're called and and for as long as it serves a purpose just to keep it going oh but how about the ukrainian people hundreds of thousands yeah well <laughs> I don't think they care. And with the same with the Israeli Palestine. I think that the world is watching, but they have decided that this is going to take place and it's going to take place. And if uh, in two weeks' time we see tanks rolling over dead bodies and live bodies and so on, what is the world going to do about it so it has it has been it has been decided that this is what is going to happen and this is what is going to take and uh, um, <clears throat> there is um, what can we do about it um, not very much I was uh, reflecting on that when I say uh, not very much, it's not that I am pessimistic, and in, in it's just that it's not that I don't want to hope, or that I refuse to to see a ray of hope. It's just that I think we are a little bit naive in understanding the circumstances we are in. And we all want to do the right thing, but um, you know, if you think of um, Don Quixote, used to <coughs> was um, had had his heart in the right place. He wanted to do the right thing. He wanted to go out there to help and save uh, widows and orphans and so on. Fine. So the point is, he was mad. Because he was rather innocent about it all, about the world. He was naive, wasn't he? And when he comes back home, disappointed at the end, and they said he recovered his uh, his state of mind. He was uh, he recovered his sanity, his his mental sanity. It's not so much that; is that he finally saw the reality of the world, and good and evil. And sometimes it's not that we are pessimistic about it; it's just that we we have to be realistic because you know if we are not realistic we might end up you know with a piss pot on our heads <laughs> thinking that it is a helmet uh, <laughs> he realized that there is uh, good and bad in the world and uh, perhaps he couldn't change it and um uh, and the disappointment and the hurt that came from that. So I do, I do want to hope. I think everybody does, but I, I, I see the world as a dark place at the moment. And I was reflecting upon my life. Um, I've lived a long life, and uh, I went from as a tiny little girl, sort of uh, n no running water. My mother, I remember cooking on an open fire, you know, with wood and everything. And you, and you had a little triangle over the the fire, and you put the pot there. And and every now and again, you had to blow in order to keep the fire going. <laughs> <laughs> I remember the first time I saw a car. 
and and I remember the first time I saw a plane overhead and we were all going like this my goodness um, and now this and when I said uh, they are on a binge I think is because the depravity I think is so great that um, the problem is nuclear weapons isn't it because in earlier times we could fight to the death and so on but today with nuclear weapons and I am hoping that at some point they will just not think well if we can't get what we want if we are going down we'll take the whole thing down with us that is what I hope for. Anyway, let me tell you what I'm going to do because I don't want to be a cold shower here and um, and I'm going to end up perhaps on a, on a better note because I don't want to depress anybody but this is what is on my mind at the moment. So are you ready for it? I'm going to read you another little story, little letter by our old friend Seneca, the one I practice with. But I didn't practice for so long. I did practice a little bit, but not so much. But in any case, I'm going to, if you care to stay with me. I know that by now I have lost <laughs> just about everybody. Those who are looking for entertainment, obviously, this is not the place. So they have already left. All right, so this is letter number 56 on quiet and study. If I can get my microphone here properly. I have to hold it. I have to get another one. Okay. Curse me <laughs> if I think anything more indispensable than silence for a man who seduces himself in order to study. Imagine what a variety of noises reverberates about my ears. I have lodgings right over a bathing establishment. So picture to yourself the assortment of sounds which are strong enough to make me hate my very powers of hearing. When your strenuous gentleman, for example, is exercising himself by flourishing laden weights, when he is working hard or else pretends to be working hard, I can hear him grunt. And whenever he releases his imprisoned breath, I can hear him panting in wheezy and high-pitched tones. Or perhaps I notice some lazy fellow content with a cheap rub down, and I hear the crack of the pummeling hand on his shoulder, varying in sound according as the hand is laid on flat or hollow. Then perhaps a professional comes along shouting out it, his score. That is the finishing touch. And so, and uh, add to this the arresting of an occasional a uh, roisterer or pickpocket, the racket of the man who always likes to hear his own voice, voice in the bathroom, or the enthusiast who plunges into the swimming tank with an uh, un unconscionable noise and splashing all over. Besides, besides all those whose voices, if nothing else, are good, imagine the hair plucker with his penetrating shrill voice for purposes of advertisement. Continuous, continually giving, giving it a vent and never holding his tongue except when he's plucking the armpits and making his victim yell instead. Then the cake seller with his various cries, the sausage man, the confectioner, and all the vendors of food hawking their wares, each with his own distinctive intonation. So you say, 
What higher nerves or deadened ears you must have, if your mind can hold out amid so many noises, so various and so discordant. But I assure you that this racket means no more to me than the sound of waves or falling water, although you will remind me that a certain tribe once moved their city merely because they could not endure the noise of a Nile cataract. Words seem to distract me more than noises, for words demand attention, but noises merely fill the ears and beat upon them. Among the sounds that clatter around me without distracting, I include passing carriages, a machinist in the same block, a saw sharpener nearby, or some fellow who is demonstrating with little pipes and flutes at the trickling fountain, shouting rather than singing. Furthermore, an sporadic noise upsets me more than a steady one. But by this time I have toughened my nerves against all that sort of thing, so, I, so that I can endure even a boatswain marking the time, a mariner marking the time in high-pitched tones for his crew. For I force my mind to concentrate and keep it from straying to things outside itself. All outdoors may be, may be a mayhem, provided that there is no disturbance within, provided that fear is not wrangling with desire in my breast, provided that meanness and lavishness are not at odds, one harassing the other. For of what benefit is a quiet neighborhood if our emotions are in an uproar? Twas the night, and all the world was lulled to rest. This is not true, for no real rest can be found when reason has... My, tel my microphone is bothering me. Okay. That is not true, for no real rest can be found when reason has not done the lulling. Night brings our troubles to the light rather than banishes them. It merely changes the form of our worries. For even when we seek slumber, our sleepless moments are as harassing as daytime. I had to change my glasses. Real tranquility is the state reached by an unperverted mind when it is relaxed. Think of the unfortunate man who courts sleep by surrendering his spacious mansion to silence, who, that his ear may be disturbed by no sound, bids the whole retinue of his slaves be quiet, and that whoever approaches him shall, shall walk on tiptoe. He tosses from side to side to that and seeks a fitful slumber amid his frettings. He complains that he has heard sounds when he has not heard them at all. The reason, you ask, his soul is in an uproar. It must be soothed and its rebellious murmuring checked. You need not suppose that the soul is at peace just because the body is still. Sometimes quiet means disquiet. We must therefore rouse ourselves to action and busy ourselves with interests that are good, as often as we are in the grasp of an uncontrollable sluggishness. Great generals, when they see that their men are mutinous, check them by some sort of labor or keep them busy with the small forays. The much occupied man has no time for wantonness, and it is an obvious commonplace that the evils of leisure can be shaken off by hard work. Although people may often have thought, 
that I sought seclusion because I was disgusted with politics and regretted my hapless and thankless position, yet in the retreat to which apprehension and weariness have driven me, my ambition sometimes develops afresh. For it is not because my ambition was rooted out that it has abated, but because it was wearied or perhaps even put out of temper by the failure of its plans. And so with luxury also, we, which sometimes seems to have departed. And then when we have made a profession of frugality begins to fret us and amid our economics seeks the pleasures which we have merely left but not condemned. Indeed, the more stealthily it comes, the greater is its force. For all unconcealed vices are less serious. A disease also is farther on the road to being cured when it breaks forth from concealment and manifests its power. So with greed, ambition and the other evils of the mind, you may be sure that they do most harm when they are hidden behind the pretense of soundness. Men think that we are in retirement and yet we are not. For if we have sincerely retired and have sounded the signal for retreat and have scorned outward attractions, then, as I remarked above, no outward things will distract us. No music of men or of birds can interrupt good thoughts when they have once become steadfast for sh and sure. The mind that the mind which jumps up at words or at chance sounds is unstable and has not yet withdrawn into itself. It contains within itself an element of anxiety and rooted fear, and this makes one a prey to care. As our poet Virgil says, I whom of your no dart could cause to flee, nor Greeks with crowded lines of infantry. Now, sh now I shake at every sound and fear the air, both for my child and for the load I bear. This, <clears throat> this man, in his first state, is why, wise. He shrinks neither at the brandished spear nor at the clashing armor of the packed the packed foe nor at the commotion of the stricken city this man in his second state lacks knowledge fearing for his own concerns he pales at every sound any cry is taken for the battle shout and overthrows him. The slightest disturbance renders him breathless with fear. It is the load that makes him afraid. Select any one you please from among your favorites of fortune, trailing their many responsibilities, carrying their many burdens, and you will behold the picture of Virgil's hero fearing both for his child and for the load he bears. You may therefore be sure that you are at peace with yourself when no noise readies you, when no word shakes you out of yourself, whether it be of flattery or of threat, or merely an empty sound buzzing about you with unmeaning noise. What then, you say, is it not sometimes a simpler matter just to avoid the uproar? I admit this. And accordingly, I shall change from my present quarters. I merely wish to test myself and to give myself practice. Why need I be tormented any longer? 
when Ulysses himself found so simple a cure for his comrades even against the songs of the sirens. Farewell. I don't know whether you are familiar with the story of Ulysses and, and the sirens. When, when, um, when approaching the silent islands, Ulysses becomes enchanted with the sea creatures singing. And first he commands and then he begs and then he cries to his men to untie him. The crew, with their ears full of beeswax, wax, uh, see that actually the sirens, for what they truly are, deadly monsters. I leave you with this and hope that I haven't... Uh, <laughs> that you're not feeling worse than you were before. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.